Hi, I'm Stephen Keller, and welcome to the second part of our two-part series here at LumenVox.com, talking about converting DTMF-based applications to using speech recognition. In this part, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the discussion by looking at some different styles of speech applications you can build. We'll also talk about building good prompts and designing good grammars and how these two kind of interplay and work with one another. So the first thing we've got to cover is what type of application you're going to build. There are two broad types we talk about, and the first is what we call natural language. And natural language is what a lot of people envision their speech application being when they first get into it. The idea is a caller calls up and you ask a very open-ended question. Hi, thanks for calling Company X. What would you like to do? Now that question has a lot of possible responses, and users just interact with it naturally and say what they'd like. Now the real danger with natural language applications is that the number of responses is much, much, much higher than most developers probably realize in advance. So what happens is you have to try and account for so many responses that it tends to be a little difficult to develop. Now it's nice for users in the sense that it's very natural and easy to use, but there's this kind of thing where it's not so great for them because if the developer fails to account for one of their responses, suddenly it's not as easy. So generally accuracy is a little bit lower because there's more stuff to recognize and greater chance the engine makes mistakes. So oftentimes what we recommend instead of natural language is a directed dialogue application. Now these applications ask the user specific questions and give them guidelines of what they should say. So we kind of direct their responses in a very real way with our prompts. So instead of saying, what would you like to do, we might say, hi, thanks for calling your bank. Would you like to see your checking account, hear information about your savings account, or make a transfer? And then, of course, user says, you know, checking account, or see my checking account, or, you know, savings account balance, or whatever. But we've given them, we've directed them to say what we want to hear. And so now the number of responses becomes much narrower and it becomes much easier to build and develop and test this application. Uh, because of this, generally accuracy goes up and it's easier for everyone involved. So we go ahead and give this sort of our recommendation. If, especially if you're new, definitely start out with directed dialogue. And a very important part with directed dialogue is how you design your prompts. What you want to do is avoid the traditional sort of say menus you'll hear in a lot of speech applications. You know, for checking, say checking. This is sort of a holdover like we talked about last time from the DTMF days. We had to press a number and you had to say press one for this, press two for that. Don't you know, force your users to listen to you here say this for this. Just say you can access your checking account, you can do this, you can do that, and they'll figure it out. They'll go ahead and say checking account. Just say, you know, if you'd like, you know, tell me what you'd like to do, you can access checking. They'll figure out to say access checking. Because uh, good prompts will go ahead and really give users a sort of mental model of how the application works. You know, in their head, they don't, they don't quite have the Visio flowchart in their minds, but something similar to it where they know, here I can say these things and here I can say these things, because your prompts are telling them what they can do. Uh, one thing you're going to have to add, though, that you're probably not used to is what we call confirmation prompts. So what happens is the engine works on probabilities. We're never 100% certain that we got what the user actually said. So we'll, we'll go ahead and return what we recognize the user saying and also a score associated with it we call a confidence score. This confidence score represents how likely it is that we got the user's speech correct. So we might say, uh, well, we heard the user say checking but there's only a 60% chance that we're right. And your application has to look at that confidence score and say, well, 60% is kind of low, not real certain that we got the user right. Before we transfer them to the checking account, let's confirm. So then you have the application say, oh, did you want to access your checking account? And then the user says yes or no. Now one note, don't use confirmation prompts every single time that a caller makes a response. You only do it when the confidence score is low. If we give you back a 98% certainty with our confidence score, no reason to plague the user with constantly having to say checking, yes, check balance, yes, every single time. That just frustrates everybody involved and lengthens calls. The other thing we recommend is that you avoid TTS for your prompts, text to speech when possible. You can obviously use it for dynamic data. When you're reading stuff from a database, stuff you can't pre record, TTS is great for those. We recommend it, and there are some really good TTS engines out there. 
but generally for your static prompts, you want to go ahead and work with actual recorded voices because remember, speech is supposed to be more personable, more engaging, and recorded human voices definitely fit that bill better than text-to-speech engines. Now, if you've done a good job designing prompts, your grammars will become a lot easier to design and develop. Uh, the sort of key rule with grammars is to keep them as small as you can while still providing good coverage. The grammar, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, it's a list of words that you want recognized at a single time. So if you have a given prompt, you have a grammar, the grammar is all the words that can be recognized at that prompt. You load up these grammars as you need them. Now, so what happens is if they get bigger, there's a greater chance the engine mistakes what the user said for something else in the grammar. So generally keep them smaller, you have higher accuracy. And so like we said, if you're doing good directed dialogue prompts, you're making clear what options are available, most of your users will really go ahead and give you predictable responses. You want to design your grammars to accommodate those users. What you don't want to do is try and listen to the 2 to 5% of your callers who will just give you these outrageous responses. You know, they'll, they'll just call them and they'll start swearing at the application. Or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll say off the wall nonsense stuff. You can't go ahead and start adding that nonsense into your grammars because one, you're never really going to be able to handle the, these oddball callers anyway. They're not using it appropriately. It's impossible to predict what they're going to do. And two, when you increase the grammar for the, the small percentage of callers, what happens is there's a greater chance that the rest of your callers who are behaving appropriately will get misrecognized for one of these new items you added. So we always want to say design your grammars for the majority of your callers, not for the anomalies. And you want to go ahead and part of keeping it small, also avoid words that sound very similar if you can. Words or phrases that rhyme or that, you know, if you have a fr phrase and it's four words long and you have two different phrases and, you know, three of the four words are the same in each phrase, avoid that stuff. Make each option distinct so that way uh, less chance of it getting confused because two things sound very similar. Always think, you know, in, in phones, especially say cell phones, there's a chance that part of the audio the user says never makes it into the engine. If we miss a little tiny second, you know, or not a second, uh, a fourth of a second or something of audio because the cell phone cut out for a, a brief moment, will we get confused because now this sounds exactly like something else? Go ahead and try and eliminate that possibility. And as you deploy your application, you want to go ahead and listen to what users say. You want to see how they use it. It's a process called tuning. And as part of this process, you'll find that there are certain things in your grammars that users just never, ever say. Or that they rarely say. You know, one in a thousand calls uses this particular option. Well, if you can, remove those from your grammars. It's just a good idea to prune them. Always keep them as small as possible. All right. So all of this was a very sort of high-level overview of converting DTMF to speech. There's, of course, a lot more nuances and complexities that can be involved, and we talk about those in greater detail on our website at lumenvox.com. Our speech resources section, just go up to the top and click the resources button up there. We've got white papers on this subject. We have frequently asked questions. We've got case studies and tips and tricks and all sorts of good stuff to help you out. The support section of the website, if you go up to support and then you click videos, we have a lot more training videos like this. It'll walk you through designing prompts, building up grammars, how to actually program the grammars. Um, lots more about best practices in designing and developing speech applications, tuning, all the kind of stuff that you'll really need to get your hands dirty in terms of doing this. And if you're going to be tackling a big application, also might be good to take one of our training classes. You can find those under the support section as well and we can really help you out and get you up and running in no time at all. So good luck and thanks for deciding to convert a DTMF application to use speech recognition.